For starters, let's understand what React is and what it isn't. React is a library, yes, not a framework, only a library, that lets you build user interfaces. In its core, it pretty much just lets you describe the UI you want to show by using components, and it puts out a tree of elements that can be used to render the page. React itself doesn't render the output in the browser. For that, you need React DOM, which used to be part of React, but as of right now, is its own library. So React doesn't know what the output will be used for. That's why you can take it and render it on mobile apps with React Native, for example, or even create your own library that renders the output wherever you want. React also keeps track of changes to data in your code and updates the output as soon as the data changes, using something called state. That's why it's called React. It reacts to the changes and keeps the UI in sync. Let's take a look at the most basic way you can add React to a normal HTML page. First, we import React and React DOM by using script tags. Now we need to tell React where we want to use it. Usually, in a React project, you send an empty HTML file to the client with only a div that is marked as the root, and React inserts all the contents. But that's not the only way. You can use React anywhere you want. Let's create a div and give it an ID. Now, let's create a simple like component. It has a state of like, and we set it to true if the user clicks on the button. If liked is true, we return a text string. But if liked is false, which is the initial state, we return a like button. Notice how I'm not writing any JSX, which is the HTML-like looking markup that you would usually see here. This is because React actually doesn't understand JSX or HTML. It's all just JavaScript. So you need to describe what you want to render and pass it to the createElement method in React. As you can see, in the first argument, I tell it to create a button element. In the second argument, I give it an object with props, in this case only one, which is the onClick prop, and the third argument are children. In this case, it's just a string with the name of the button. Don't worry, later we'll take a closer look. Now we need to tell React DOM where to insert this React component. We create a root node by grabbing the div that we gave an ID earlier and tell it to render our like component. And finally, let's import our like component using a script tag. Now, as you can see, we have our reactive like button in our normal HTML page. When we click on it, it changes the like state to true, which triggers a re-render, React notices that the output is different, and updates that part of the page to display the new state of the component. Now you understand what React does on a basic level, but most people wouldn't want to use React like that in a normal project. For a good developer experience, you need to combine it with a set of other libraries that for example give you a live server so that you can see what you're building in real time, including helpful errors and warnings. You likely want to add Babel to be able to use JSX instead of describing the UI with JavaScript objects. You want to have a bundler that bundles all your JavaScript code and so on. That's why the React team created something called Create React App that you're likely familiar with. It gives you a ready out of the box React project with all these tools pre configured, which makes setting up a React project a breeze. This could, in fact, be called a framework. However, React itself is just a library, and because of that, you can put together your own toolchain or use something other than Create React App. Some popular alternatives are Parcel or my personal favorite Vite. And then, of course, there is the really popular meta framework Next.js. Now, let's start diving deeper. React is declarative instead of imperative, which means you don't directly interact with the DOM, like appending HTML elements or changing them. You just describe the UI and React does the inserting and updating for you. In the previous example, we saw that React uses the createElement method and expects a JavaScript object which describes the UI. But that's not very practical, especially if you're building a complex UI with lots of components. Luckily, we have something called JSX, which stands for JavaScript XML. It lets you write HTML-like syntax, and this is what you're likely familiar with. Instead of creating this object, we can just write it like this. Looks like normal HTML, doesn't it? But if we now check our page, the button is nowhere to be found. That is because React doesn't understand JSX. It expects an object, not some weird HTML-like markup. So we need a step in between to convert it. A library called Babel is used for that. In our basic HTML page, we can just add Babel using script tags and mark the like button component. Make sure to load Babel before the component. Now, as you can see, the like button works again, and we can use JSX. So we learned that JSX is cool because you can write HTML-like syntax, but what does HTML-like even mean? JSX and HTML are actually not the same. First of all, JSX is more strict. For example, it doesn't allow self-closing tags like image. You have to close them. Also, you have to always return exactly one root element. You can't return multiple. If you want to do that, you have to either wrap it with, for example, a diff, or you can use a React fragment, which will be ignored and not appear in the DOM. 
And the last thing that makes JSX really powerful is that you can break out of the HTML syntax and insert JavaScript wherever you want. This is really powerful because you can express your UI however you want and you don't need to learn any new syntax like an Angular or Vue. If you know JavaScript, you can build UIs as complex as you want right away. But there is a downside to it. Even you, the creator of Vue.js, held a really great presentation in which he mentioned this. I highly recommend you watch it. He explains that this approach leads to countless different ways the UI can be constructed and change. So when React needs to re-render your components, it gets hard to predict what changed and where, because anything is possible. It's hard to make assumptions, which causes more work and makes this process slower. However, if you have a template-based syntax like Vue or Angular, you're more restricted. On the other hand, Vue and Angular can make more assumptions because they know what can and what can't change in your component, which leads to better performance. As you can see, JSX's freedom of expression is a double-edged sword. Now let's take a look at how React knows when to update the UI and how that process actually works. There are three steps to this. Trigger, render and commit. The first step is the trigger. There are two cases which kick off the render process. The first time the component is rendered, which happens in create root, and then every time one or more states are updated in the component or in a component that is higher up in the tree, its ancestor. Let's see that in action. If we put in a console log here, it will be executed on every render. If we refresh the page, we can see React rendered this component once. If we now click on the button that changes the state of like from false to true, we can see it triggers a re-render of the component. Now what if the like button component is inside a different component? If a state in the component above changes, does it affect it? In this example, we have a card component with a title that comes from a state and changes when we click on this button. I also put in a console lock in here. Now if I click on this button to update the title, as you can see, it also causes a re-render of the like component, which is nested inside of it. Also notice how I said one or more state changes. I'll show you what I mean. Let's take a look at this example. Here we have two states that are updated at the same time on click. If we click on this button, we can see that the component was not rendered two times, but once. This is because React doesn't immediately start the rendering process. It batches state updates to avoid too many re-renders. This can be a bit unintuitive at first and be a common cause for bugs. So here's a bonus tip. Let's console lock the state value after we update the state. Notice how the value is not the one that we set before the console lock. The reason for that is that the changes don't take place immediately. The update of the value happens after the code is executed and it's safe to update the state, which creates a delay. Let's take a look at this example. We have a button that increases the count by one three times in a row. But if we click on it, it only increases the count by one. Why is that? When a render is triggered, React creates something like a snapshot of this component and its state. That means the same snapshot is used in all of these three lines and the state count is zero every time. When the code is executed, we're adding one, but basically resetting it again in the next line because we're using the old zero value from the snapshot and adding one to it. So the end result is one. If we want to make sure that the previous state in the queue is passed, instead of giving the setter function only a value, we can pass it a function that has the most recent state. Add one to that and return it. See, now it works. Now let's go back and continue with the rendering process. Okay. After the trigger, React calls the component in which the trigger occurred. That means it just calls the functions because components are just functions that return a React element. And this process is recursive. That means if the component contains other nested components, it will call them as well until it reaches the end and nothing is left to call. What we end up with is a lightweight representation of what the UI should look like as a tree of React elements, which is called the virtual DOM. Since React already created one in the beginning, it now has two, an old one and a new one. Then a diffing algorithm compares these two trees and figures out what has changed. In the last tab, React modifies the DOM to reflect the changes using the least amount of necessary operations, and it only touches the DOM nodes that actually have changed. Technically, there is actually a fourth step, which is your browser that now has to repaint to reflect the changes. That's the overview of the whole process. But of course, there is a lot happening, and I skipped over some important details. Let's take a closer look. After hearing all of this, you may ask yourself, why is this whole process needed? Why not just skip over the whole virtual DOM 
dumb part? The answer is performance. Creating a few hundred or thousands of JavaScript objects is way faster and cheaper than writing directly to the DOM. That's one of the most expensive things that you can do. So if you have a complex UI, performance will take a hit if every time something changes, you directly modify the DOM. That's why React creates this lightweight representation of the DOM using a tree of JavaScript objects, bundles all the changes and commits them to the DOM in one go. But figuring out the differences between trees is actually really difficult. Even with state-of-the-art algorithms, the complexity of calculating the differences is an order of big O of n cubed, where n is the number of elements in the tree. If we have a tree with 1000 elements, it would require roughly 1 billion comparisons. Because that is way too expensive, in order to reduce the number of comparisons, React makes two assumptions. First, different element types produce different trees. And second, keys stay consistent across re-renders. Let's check out both of these statements. React's diffing algorithm compares the old and the new tree side by side, line by line. And as soon as it finds a change in the element type, it assumes that the UI will look different from there on. Even if the component is high up in the tree, it will rebuild everything that is nested inside of it. Now let's take a look what keys are and what role they play for the diffing algorithm. You might know that you can give keys to React elements. By default, it's null, but you can pass it a value, which is often used when rendering lists, for example. First, let's take a look what happens if you don't do that. Here we have an array of items and we use the map method to generate a list item for each of them. What happens if we append a list item? React will go line by line, compare them, see that all of these items stay the same and at the end notice that an item has been added. So there is only one difference here and all React has to do is append this in the DOM. But what if you prepend a list item? Now React compares the first item of the old tree with a newly added item in the new tree and sees it's different. The second list item is different too, because everything is shifted by one. It will have to tear down everything and create the list from scratch, even though that's not really efficient. By providing keys that should stay the same across renders, we can help React understand which items state and don't need to be rebuilt. Ideally, you want to use something like an item ID that always stays the same. A common mistake is to use index as a key. In the first case it would work, but in the second case, like here, you can see that the index doesn't stay the same, because everything is shifted by one. So the first item in the old list has a different index in the new tree. That's not helpful. Another thing worth pointing out is that state is the only thing that persists across renders. If you declare normal variables without using state, they will be resetted on each render. Also, changing them doesn't cause a re-render. They should only be used to store data that doesn't change or for computed values such as a full name that is constructed from a first and last name, for example. Now you should have a good idea of what is happening under the hood and I hope this will help you in your next React project. You might have noticed that I didn't go deep into some topics such as state, use effect, other hooks, React Fiber, and so on. If you want to see a part 2, let me know and I'll cover that as well. Anyway, that's it for this one. I'll see you in the next one.